In this video, I'll be comparing two poems authored by Mark Dotty in 1953 and Marianne Moore in 1887. Both A Green Crab Shell and The Paper Nautilus repudiate timeless art in favour of natural function and aesthetic. They focus on the passing of time, particularly deterioration and evolution, by paralleling the collapse of ancient Greece and the Roman Empire to the insistence, determination, and lasting impression of organic life. Both the narrator of a green crab shell and the nautilus of the paper nautilus are struggling with concepts of mortality and entrapment, and are comforted by the sustainable aesthetics of nature rather than man-made art. A green crab shell focuses on a narrator who, while investigating a shell, relays their discovering of inner beauty in a stream of non-verbalized thought. The speaker perceives the shell as something artistic, though anachronistic and archaic. Upon turning it, they are amazed by the internal aesthetic and they wonder how death could be sweet were we gorgeous within. In the paper Nautilus, the creature guards its unborn children, concerned with the integrity and sustainability of their shells. Moore uses similes to tie the authorities whose hopes are shaped and writers entrapped by tea time fame to the fortress made from love by the Nautilus. The former prisons are untrustworthy, the later reliable and true. The Nautilus is adamant that the young not leave their shell too young, that their fate does not mirror cancers. The cephalopod shell, an evolutionary innovation exclusive to its genus, possesses traits that are unique to the Nautilus, and cracks precisely when required. As they emerge into safety, their discarded carapaces float behind them, resembling the lines in the mane of a Parthenon horse, something artistic and tangible, physically present and provable compared to the mythological and fictitious, but still doomed to deterioration. Here, Moore also contrasts the grandiose state of ancient Greece at its prime, Hercules and Hydra, to artistic remnants preceding its abased collapse. This motif of a falling ancient Greece is used by Dotti as well. The abandoned armour is described as retrieved from a Greco-Roman wreck, patinated and oddly muscular, which parallels a gradual declination from power and prime to weakness and inferiority, like the once great civilization. Comparatively, the Nautilus evolves, surviving throughout time from a thin glass shell to the status of a hero, suggesting shells are entrapments that have developed societally, such as writers, authorities, and warriors, are less reliable or natural than lovecrafted or organically natural constraints, even if, as the title suggests, the carapace is paper thin. The narrator in a green crab shell is concerned with life's impermanence and the impurity of his own shell, and finds relief through the beauty of another's life's remains. The Nautilus, faced with protecting its unborn, holds them tight until they escape through force, leaving their remains artistically behind. The paper Nautilus comprises five septic stanzas, with a rhyming second and fifth. The rhyming scheme is structured to provide momentum to the long fifth line, climaxing the built-up passion of the lines before. The sixth and seventh lines then continue, providing enchantment into the next stanza, whereupon the rhyming scheme rebuilds itself. The lines, she scarcely eats until the eggs are hatched, for instance, can be read as a macabre alternate fate whereupon the Nautilus, a weaker and worse parent, devours the young. The first stanza works as an introduction of sorts, being punctuated by a full stop, and the second details the egg's construction. The third and fourth stanzas then comprise the Nautilus's battle to protect the unhatched offspring, and the fifth, their eventual emergence. Perhaps the structure of the paper Nautilus intentionally resembles the namesake, with an arched shell and small legs protruding outwards. Each stanza's form waves with its measure and syntax just as a Nautilus floats underwater. Whereas the elegiac, a green crab shell, comprises 13 terset stanzas, with no rhyming aside from the appropriately tied die and sky towards the end. The structure is sharp, with disjointed measure and syntax, short and precise, much like the scuttling of a crab's movements. The disrupted meter moves when reading, back and forth, almost stochastic and autonomous. This forces the reader's eyes to read in quick and short bursts, driving the rhythm forward with few pauses. The first and last stanzas are also shaped like sharp crustacean foreclaws, with occasional occurrence outside these two instances, presenting a snappy stanza structure with plenty of contextual relevance. Both poets utilise hyphens. Dotty uses them to signify a moment of contemplation, such as in the case of what his fantastic legs were like, and if we could be opened into this. 
and conjure a natural pause before resuming, whereas more uses one as relief, coming from the shell, free it when they are freed, when the young are safe and the danger has been alleviated. The title of the paper Nautilus carries motifs of weakness, purity and delicacy that imply a timid, fragile creature, and while that technically may be the case, with the thin glass shell and the perishable souvenir of hope, the subject of the poem is hallmarked by its strength and determination. The Nautilus here is defined by integrity, a maker, a devil, a fortress, who guards day and night. The speaker in a green crab shell roots the moment as forever occurring. He appraises the not exactly green shell with a history we cannot know, and after perceiving the shell's innards, comparatively wonders whether we could be opened up into this. He freezes the scene, perpetually suspending the realisation that beauty can come from mortality or the deceased, and grants the dead crab shell the spotlight, honouring its memory of elegiac immortalisation. Similarly, the title A Green Crab Shell is significant depending on interpretation, as the crab may have been either immortalised or resurrected. The shell discovered by the speaker is a patinated bronze, meaning the crab shell has been restored to its previous green state for the title, or else the crab was green and it is the shell itself that Dottie has reincarnated for titular purposes. In remembrance of the crab, it is optimistically regarded as fantastic, with a little travelling case, preserved in kind brine, the size of a damtas. This illustrates a playful and innocent portrait of the creature, humanising the weaker specimen with harmless motifs of cutlery and luggage. Further humanisation is applied at the poem's conclusion, comparing the crab's cadaver with our own to ask, what colour is the underside of skin? In contrast, a Nautilus poem is told with a closed tone, safeguarded and fearful, matching the personified creature's thoughts, which are elegant and sophisticated, if not broken or disorganised. The poem relies on contextual knowledge, using referential metaphors, particularly one regarding ancient Greece, Ionic Chitin Falls and Parthenon Horse, to describe the enigmatic creature, also known as an Argonaut, which shares its name with a band of voyaging heroes in Greek mythology due to the incorrect assumption that they use their tentacles, like sails. The words Hercules, Ionic, and Parthenon intentionally catch the eye's attention due to their appropriate capitalization the way Giotto and Greco Roman do, supplementing the connotations of ancient Greece already contextually prevalent through both poems. Like fallen Greece, the crab's demise in a green crab shell came about despite powerful or muscular qualities because a gull's gobbled away at the crab with its forecalls, gestures of menace and power, helpless to stop the crab's fate. There's a sense of epiphanic euphoria which builds throughout the poem, climaxing at the exclamation mark in the ninth stanza. The narrator ceases detail in the crab, breathes, then continues, imagine breathing, surrounded by the brilliant rinse of summer's firmament. Both poems end on a positive tone, with the nautilus young hatching out of its many arms, as if the only fortress strong enough to trust to and the narrator finding relief in death so long as he could be opened into this, reveal some sky. Their fears regarding imprisonment and containment, whether that be bodily aesthetic, fears of an early escape, the self within the body or even mortality, are conquered by witnessing the remnants of a shell left behind. The discarded carapaces represent relief and humility, natural synergy and constant evolution for them, in a way that the art of ancient Greece failed.